Hello, everybody, and welcome again to Knocked Conscious. This is Mark, and I am sitting here across the country from Robin Clare. Robin, you're in Hartford, Connecticut. Is that correct? That's correct. Excellent. Robin has is a very interesting person. She wrote a new book, Feast and Famine, Healing Addiction with Grace. It's a number one Amazon bestseller. Came out about a month ago. Um, Robin, could you would you like to share a little bit about your credentials? And uh, we'd love to hear your story of how we got to this book and how we got through your journey as a whole. Yes, thank you, Mark, and thank you so much for having me on your show. So I um, I started my journey um, as many people have in corporate America, and but I always had this gift of being able to hear messages from the divine realm. And when I refer to the divine realm, <clears throat> I'm referring to all of divinity, all angels, all spirit guides, uh, all deceased loved ones. And so I was in corporate America and I, and I spent a year on my deck every night asking, how can I be of greater service to mankind? And what I didn't know is that I was actually committing my life to being of divine service. And so over the course of three years, I started figuring out a business plan for my business, which would become enlightened professionals. And in the meantime, I started studying different forms of energy healing, like Reiki. I'm a Reiki master. I'm a 13th octave Laho Chi master. I am an advanced Akashic record reading reader, and, and I then at some point in the journey, when I first came out of corporate America, I opened three retreat centers to be able to bring other types of uh, healers and scholars to the greater Hartford area. And then one day I heard, what about you? You're the, you're the teacher. And I'm like, well, I'm doing a great job being the event producer. I like that yeah. <laughs> because it was comfortable for me, Mark, because it was more in alignment with what I was doing in my corporate job. Absolutely. But they're like, they're like, we have bigger plans for you. Um, so to become more comfortable speaking in public and we're going to be asking you to write. And so the first book that I was asked to write was a book called Messiah Within, a guide to embracing your inner divinity. And this is a channeled book. So I'm also a channel for the Ascended Masters. And this book was written um, with uh, Yeshua, who many people refer to as Jesus. And um, he, I refer to him as Yeshua because he comes to me as Rabbi Yeshua from the Old Testament. And so we wrote this book together <clears throat> and so the concept, if I, if I may, yeah. Robin, um, mm -hmm. there's a couple concepts that we'll get back to that you had mentioned yes. about the Akashic records mm -hmm. and everything. Cause I, uh, there's a lot of people probably new to a lot of this. Yes. Uh, and my, my purpose is as a pretty newbie or a neophyte is to help people kind of bridge that gap between what's not yes. known or what is, we'll get back mm -hmm. to that, but really quickly about are, are you saying Christ consciousness, correct, is Yeshua? I am. Okay. Yes, so, in, in, in this book, he referred to it as Messiah consciousness, okay. but it's the same thing. And I'm familiar with Messiah consciousness from the, the as I believe uh, Jesus was became the priest of a group that the Messiah was prior. It was the Messiah kind of whole thing with the Bible and, and all that, right? Yeah, and, and basically what he's saying in, in Messiah Within is that <clears> – <throat> We are each the Messiah of our own lives. And so that sort of flies in the face of Christianity and Judaism. In Christianity, most people believe he is the Messiah. In Christianity, we're still waiting for the Messiah. And so, um, so what he's saying is, is that when you find that connection to your own inner world, that mm -hmm. your own inner divinity, and you live from that place like inward out, versus outward living, right. right? If you live from the inside, from your heart-based, from love-based versus outwardly, which is usually fear-based, when you live inwardly from, from this place of heart-centeredness, then you become the Messiah of your own life because from this inner place, all types of miracles are, are possible in your life. Right. And the consciousness is very important. I mean, the reason this was, I titled this Knocked Conscious is because my first spiritual 
experience uh, just literally just knocked me awake in a weird way. Yes. Um, it mm -hmm. didn't knock me out. It knocked me up in a weird like. Yes. <laughs> For, yes. for a bad term, that's probably the worst term to use, but uh, <laughs> I got pregnant but, with the spirit. No, yes, uh, but it, it really woke me up and, and it was like that. And I've, I've had a challenge with the Jesus person versus the Jesus spirit for my, my adult throughout my adult adulthood, because I come from science, but I'll let, I'm going to table that and we'll talk about that later. So Messiah Within was your first book that you'd written then? Yeah, the first book and it was challenging. Um, it was challenging because, first of all, I didn't really, I didn't, wasn't raised a Christian, so I didn't really know anything about Jesus, right? And how were um, you raised, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, yeah, I was, I was raised um, in, in the Jewish faith, and so you know, I, I didn't really know him. Um, in fact, he was kind of scary to me, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so when he came to me to ask me that. I was really scared and I said, the only way that I'm ever going to be able to do this is to find out not what is different about us, but what do we have in common? Yes. And that's what, and that's when I started studying the Christ consciousness, which to me, if I had to boil it down, it's about oneness, right? The Christ consciousness. Well, it is right? because it's kind of like knowing that everything is one is if you do something anywhere, it will still affect you. Yeah. Uh, yes. So even even an outward act at someone else affects you because you yes. are part of what you attacked as well. Yeah. It's, yes. It's 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 a simple concept. It's just not easy. I think is, it's <laughs> never easy. Well, that's what that's what I love to say about spirituality in general is that it's so easy. It's hard. Yeah. Right? We, over, we kind of um, put too much into it because we we have to yeah. assign some kind of meaning to everything in in a weird way. Yeah. So what? Here's something interesting about Messiah within. When I went to write it, I agreed to write it because I, I discovered that we had so much alike. And I was sitting there writing, trying to write, and I was staring at my computer. Um, and Yeshua said to me, um, can I, what's the problem, right? And I said, I, I'm neither an author, a channel, or a Judaic scholar or a Christian scholar. I don't know what I'm doing. And he said to me, well, do you need a coach? I said, I do. He said, who would you like? And I said, James Troyman. He's my favorite author, spiritual author. And the next right. day I get an email. I'm on uh, James Twyman's list. And he says, I woke up this morning inspired to be a spiritual author book coach. Does anybody need any help? There you go. <laughs> there you go. Right. And so um, I'm like, I guess that's me. That first epiphany of boom. There it goes. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So then it, and, yeah. and could you please say uh speak his name again? I'm I'll be honest, I'm not here with many um authors on that because we find ourselves kind of internally trying to search before we become outward, right? I mean, we have to find kind of fix ourselves in a way. Yes. What so name, the author James Twyman, T W Y M A N. Okay. I may have heard that name. I obviously mm -hmm. familiar with, you know, you hear some of the big names, right? The yeah, and he's a and, Mm -hmm. And he's a filmmaker. He's a Hay House author. Hay House um, author. Okay. Hay House is obviously a large uh, book publication mm -hmm. for spiritual, right? And, and right. You know, kind of uh, uh, a kind of publication mm -hmm. for that specified towards that. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And so the the other thing I want to say interesting about Messiah Within when I finally so I'm really struggling to write this book and um, it's twelve steps to becoming your Messiah Within, right? And so Yeshua says. Um, do you want me to tell you the 12 steps? I said, yeah, that'd be helpful. So he's, he's starting and I'm typing and he gave me the 12 steps. And what I realized, Mark, is that from the time I stood on my deck asking the question, how can I be of service to mankind? I started living those steps. Oh, absolutely. And when he, and when he gave me the steps, I had lived steps one through 10 already. Yeah. And it's you I was let shocked. go, right? You just follow the path. Mm -hmm. You you become you become the leaf on the on the water, right? You just follow the yes. flow of the water versus resisting all the time. Yes. And so what I had to do, here's the here's the most interesting part. Your readers, your excuse me, your listeners will will what will understand this. But I actually knew what step eleven and step twelve were, but I hadn't live them. So I had to relax into a place of what I call divine 
timing. Okay. Right. Yeah. They would happen when they're going to happen, Correct. not because I, happen I in, want them. Right. It all happens kind of organically in a way. You can't force it. It's force nothing, mm -hmm. fight nothing. Right. Is kind of the right the the concept where you don't want to force something to happen, but you also, if you see, see a, a message or something, you don't want to also just dismiss it because you, you're not ready for it or something. Yeah. So what I would do, Mark, is I would, something would happen. I would be like, Oh, is this step 11? And <laughs> then I'd be like, no. And then I realized step 11 and step 12 came in with the same spiritual two by fours that, that steps one through 10 did. Interesting. So, <laughs> so when they came in, I knew, I truly knew that this was part going to be part of the book. Oh, absolutely. So it's interesting, 12 steps, right? We have a 12 step program yes. in AA or in any yes. kind of addiction. There, uh, Jordan, Jordan Peterson speaks of 12 simple rules. Yes. Uh, it's interesting. What, there's got to be a special place for the number 12. In, in well, 12 program. is a, yeah, and 12 is even more significant. I mean, you had the 12 tribes of Israel. Right. Right? right. The original, the original. Um, uh, well, you have the disciples, right? You've got 12 playing itself throughout. 12 disciples, right? You have through... the 12 signs of the Zodiac. Yeah, so you've got 12 playing through all of this. I'm, I'm curious how much it's connected to possibly astrology or some other things. These are just my thoughts. Yeah. It's not saying that it is, but it's very interesting yeah. that 12 plays itself all the way through both you know, a, a text like the Bible through into current lives where AA is based on 12 step. It's all 12 steps. So it's interesting. Yeah. 12. Yeah. So I guess if you were to look up the numerology of 12, I think it would be a very interesting conversation. We certainly could do that in a future time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you come together with Messiah, uh, Messiah within is the book, correct? right? Right. And this is with Yeshua. Yes. And what happens after you launch that book? Well, how was the reception? You know, how, how was it received in your community and in the general community as a whole? Yeah, so it was very well received um, from the spiritual community because it it's so simply written. Um, you know, I, I, I like to write simply. I, I feel like I always say I'm writing as if my mom asked me a question. Not that my mom is simple, but she no. didn't grow up with any of this, right? My mom's actually pretty brilliant. But when she would ask me a question about spirituality, I would want to say it so that she understood it. And that's how I write. Now, some people may say that's not true, Robin, because your book is filled with spiritual concepts that maybe other people haven't learned yet. But I'm going to stand strong and say that my books are written in a simple manner that if you spend time with them, they will sink in, sure. right? The concepts and, will sink in. And when you say written simply, you're, you're, they're, they're written in a way that can easily explain something or, or you know, yes. reel it back so you're not using ex, you know, crazy terms that other people can't understand. Yeah, and I would say that is probably one of my, personally, one of my, my nicest gifts is that I, I have this ability to explain spiritual concepts in maybe plain English. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. I'm not sure. I use a lot, sure of, analogies. Use a lot mm -hmm. of analogies with with it, mm -hmm. and and that is the mark of of you know being able to explain a concept that is unknown to someone to you know well. Being able to do that well is a is a gift for sure. Yeah. It's a talent. Yeah. Yeah, so so the book was, you know, well received in the spiritual community. In in our Jewish community, it was a little awkwardly received and and for me, I had to really lean into that and stand in the power of the teachings um and not allow that people to influence me, but I can't tell you that that always happened and I can't tell you that it didn't take a couple of years be to to um to lean into that and we'll yeah. get into that too well that's with the hardest thing i mean you put yourself out there and uh mm -hmm. you're basically exposed to take all kinds of criticism and you know vehement from anyone first of all secondly yeah. it's you know that that weird reverse uh it's like a reverse uh po policy where you know, for every 10 good things that happen, you might get one positive response about it. But for every one bad thing that happens, 10 bad, 10 people hear about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so yes. you're basically, everyone's always looking to troll or to be, you know, to, there's a lot of destructors or, you know, people just not understanding that we're trying to build something here. 
Yes. So it's much easier yes. to destroy than, than build, for sure. Yeah, so I spoke a lot about the book. You know, I spent a lot of time with it. And and then um, and then one about 18 months later, after the book was published, Yeshua returned to me in a dream. And he said, come and teach with me where I am, Robin. And I said, oh, I don't know, Yeshua. I can't leave now. My family needs me. I just don't think they're ready for me to leave. And he actually laughed at me. And he said, well, then teach where you are, you know, and right. I then I said, OK, thank you, Yeshua. And then and then I woke up and I said to myself, oh, my God, Yeshua just asked me to die. And then I said, mm -hmm. wait a minute. No, he didn't. He just <laughs> asked me to kick it up a notch. Yeah. He was basically saying to me, you're not living the teachings in Messiah with him. <laughs> so right. then I went on this uh with a vengeance, I started like looking under every rock in my life to say, why am I not living these teachings, right? Yeah. And it took me about a, another 18 months to write another book called um, The Divine Keys, um, 18 Keys to Living a Divinely Guided Life. So there's another divisible by three number, 18, sure. right? Absolutely. Which yeah. means in, uh, in Judaism, 18, you know, you hear l'chaim. Right. So so high means life. And and every 18 years is a, a possibility for a new life within a given lifetime. Yeah. So so I um, so I wrote this book and then I sent it to my editor and she said, Robin, I'm I'm really sorry to say, but this book sounds like you're whining. <laughs> So I said, I am whining. This was really hard. And she's like, I suggest that you shelve that book for until you can stop whining. And I'm like, OK, so I put it yeah. on a shelf. It's funny. The next... We, we uh, do that sometimes, don't we? we, we yeah. It sounds like kind of a bitch fest in a way, but you're really, yes. you're really just trying to express concepts, but you're, you're not familiar with how to cope explaining them properly yet so you just, yeah you just blah <laughs> yeah i know what it's like trust me some of our podcasts so, become like that they just rant <laughs> so the next summer i was walking on the beach with my son and it hit me that the divine keys was more of a meditative book and what i decided is i decided to strip everything out of this book except for the keys okay and then my son is a photographer and so i borrowed um, 18 of his beautiful nature photography pictures. And, and it's interesting. I had my mom help me. She was an English major. We had to get from entire chapters down to one or two paragraphs. That's wow. It. Yeah. I, I am very chapter. familiar with the writing, writing process for sure. Yes. It's hard and, to be um, succinct. It's hard to take things out. You get wordy and, and it loses a lot of meaning and the shorter you can make it, the better, but yes. it's, it's a challenge always. It's a challenge. So my favorite part of the Divine Keys, um, illuminating the path to oneness, I was walking on the beach by myself, the same beach. This is a very sacred beach in Massachusetts called Good Harbor Beach okay. in Gloucester. And, um, and I was walking on the beach, and all of a sudden I see this very majestic bird come flying towards me. And it, it lands next to me. I'm the only one on the beach. It's a beautiful white heron which is not native to that area. Okay. And it walked the beach with me. And I knew that this heron was significant, obviously, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, how often are you walking on the beach and a heron lands next to you and walks with you, right? Absolutely, sure. And so, so, what I, as, so I'm just reading from the book right here what the heron's message is. As a water creature, the heron is a symbol of going with the flow and working with the elements of mother nature rather than struggling against her. Deeply drawn to the ocean and to all of nature, Robin became even more inspired to complete the book, The Divine Keys. And so the, the heron came to me to inspire me to, to finish the book. And so, of course, the cover of The Divine Keys is a picture of the heron that was walking with me. <laughs> And um, so that's a, it's a, it's a lovely, it's a small book and it, but it, it each, it's co contemplative to take you through, I feel like there are three stages. One is talking the talk of spirituality, then, then uh, talking, walking the talk, 
and then walking the walk. And so these 18 keys are divided into six within each of those sections. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then and then and then it's like little contemplative book. Excellent. Yeah, I, I do find longer books, especially with regarding spirituality, to be challenging because you lose you lose a lot of meaning of the actual topics in the verbiage of language. language yes. Is such a tricky thing sometimes. <clears throat> you know? Yes. Yeah. So Excellent. moving so, down down yeah, the so lane. You finished with, uh, so you had Messiah Within. And then right. the second book was the uh, divine. What was the exact title of it again? Divine the keys. divine keys, uh huh, and illuminating the path to oneness. And so then, you know, I was just kind of enjoying, enjoying myself. The two books. I'm an author. I'm a teacher. Right. And then w one day, I'm in a meditation, and I'm I'm actually in a waterfall in the meditation, and beautiful water is, you know, coming down on me, and I open my eyes and I see this magnificent being of light come walking towards me and she's magnificent oh my god her face and but her face mark kept changing really? it became every woman every age every ethnicity um and so i was mesmerized and i'm like well okay i don't think she's here to have me watch her face <laughs> so i i brought myself together right and right. and and she said i am sophia and it is my turn for you to write a book with me and could and you I'm explain like, who sophia is oh i sure can Excellent. i sure Thank can you. because nobody knows who sophia is so sophia is grace she's the energy of grace on our on our planet and she has Another name, people know her as the Holy Spirit. Okay. And so she she doesn't really have a name, right? Mm -hmm. And and if if I ask anyone who the Holy Spirit is, no one knows who the Holy Spirit is. And so the Father we know is God, the Son is Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And Sophia is the mother. She's the, the she's the divine universal mother. So is she and, an equivalent to like a Gaia or is she different than Gaia? In that well, respect? Gaia is Mother Earth. Right. Gaia is, is the, the energy of the energy, Earth. Right? Yes. Yes. So, so she's just so, the feminine energy of the triad. She is, okay. but she's really considered the, the, the head of the divine feminine. Okay, absolutely. That makes sense. Yes, sure. right? And so mm -hmm. anybody else who has been associated with that is part of her team, even like Mother Mary or Mary right. Magdalene sure. or or um, Isis, right? Other mm -hmm. other other strong people. Very familiar people. with Isis. And, yes. <laughs> Sirius, and so, is, Sirius is the star. That's the one. So. Yes, yes. For me anyway. And so, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. and so what she said is, I'd like you to write a book. So I want to say that these book titles were given to me from from the divine realm. And so she said, I'd like to for you to write a book, Robin, called um, Feast and Famine, Healing Addiction with Grace. And I'm like, oh, God, I knew this book was coming. And I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. And, and, and she said to me, because and she said, so I not only want you to talk about how by embracing certain spiritual concepts, we can we can bring people out of addiction. But she also said, and I want you to share your story of addiction. And so that's where it got real for me, Mark, mm -hmm. because for 40 years, well, maybe a little less than, for 40 years, I've struggled with obsessive food, obsessive compulsive food disorder and bulimia. And very few people knew that about me. So here I was writing this book Messiah within the divine keys, but I was an addict, sure. right? Yeah. And absolutely. so, so I, the first time I wrote Feast and Famine, I wrote it as an addict and I had no ending for the book. Ending was, well, I hope this worked for you. I hope these teachings work for you. They didn't work for me, but I hope they work for you. And I wish you the very best of luck. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, Wasn't a very absolutely. powerful ending. Right. Yeah. Absolutely so not. it doesn't sound that way anyway. So I the only way that that I could publish this book was I had to publish it from recovery. And so I had to come into 
recovery. I had to really not only spend time with the teachings, but also do very traditional things like going to a therapist and different different scenarios. I had an entire team. I'm very engaged in energy healing modalities to help me to heal my energetic field. So we are both a human being and an energy being. Right. Well, and energy, right? let's be honest, matter is energy transformed. It is a direct correlation there. Energy and yes. matter can, are exchangeable. Um, all That's the way down right. to the quantum world. So yeah, I'm very familiar with that, <laughs> with yes. that concept. Yeah. Yeah. So basically for your listeners, our energetic field surrounds and is within our human body and any dis-ease in the energetic field, because I love that word dis-ease, mm -hmm. can, if it's not healed in your energetic field, can turn into disease in the physical body. Yes. That's true. Right? Yes, absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's very important when you're going through any type of healing quest to look at what is going on in your energetic field, your, the field that connects you to all universal energy, right? Absolutely. You, you have your own, right? And so, you know, things need to be healed. And so I needed to do that in my own life. I needed to look at what was going on in my physical body, what was going on in my energetic field, what was going on in my spiritual nature, what was going on in my mental health, sure. what was going on in my emo em emotional health. Because if I really was going to come into recovery from a 40 year problem, right? Yeah. That took, that took a lot of it. I call it living an examined life. Mm -hmm. And, and I just looked at everything. And then, you know, I got a message from my grandmother uh, and a friend was doing a reading for me, and she basically said, if I didn't stop um, with the bulimia, I would die. Um, because I would maybe pop a gasket or something. I know yeah, that sounds absolutely. sort of silly. I don't know no, what else well, to well, say. It. Well, bulimia, I I know people who were anorexic and bulimic, and it creates really bad situations internally. It basically, basically yourself from the inside out. It's, yes. it's not attractive. I, I had a friend that was down in uh, 80 pounds or something before we yes. really got her help. And it was, it's, yes. challenged. it's hard. It's hard to go through that. I can yeah, imagine because what it's, it's like to be the person going through it, but it's hard to even watch someone go through it. Yes. And with bulimia, what I learned is that you're really purging your inner pain. Yeah. It's the only way that you know how. And, um, and so that's typically what happens in bulimia. You, you overeat, you know, you're victimizing yourself by really eating ridiculous amounts of food. And then you become the victimizer of yourself by right. purging the food. Yeah. And, um, and so what happened then is coming into recovery, I, I just looked at the entire book again and basically rewrote it from a place of recovery so that I couldn't, because I knew that I had successfully integrated the teachings into my life. Excellent. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. So how did you even get on the spiritual path in the first place? I mean, what was your first epiphany or, or uh, communication with other? Well, things would happen to me, Mark, that I didn't even... No, I didn't know what the word spiritual was. So, sure. um, you know, now, I, I grew up in a traditionally in a, uh, Jewish household with oh, synagogue yeah. or anything or not, not as strongly as, you know, my husband did, but, okay. you know, we did all the holidays. We were more, we were more um, ceremonial Absolutely. than, yeah. than traditional. And, and so, but we, you know, we, we did everything. And, and then one day I, um, I was in, I came out of college and I went, was working in a public accounting firm and I stood up in the middle of tax season, beginning of March. And I, I was in like in the bullpen and I said, sorry, everybody, but I have to go to New York now to see my grandmother. And they're like, what? And I, I picked up my pocketbook and I got on a train and I went to see my grandmother and I called my family. I said, you need to come see grandma. And she was in the hospital and, and then she died in my arms. Oh. So that was like the first, there, right? I mean, that's I was amazing. able to get there. Yeah. Because I got this message that was like, go to New York, just get up and go. And, 
I didn't even know that I was getting up and going. I didn't even know that it was a message, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like I it know, was, yeah. and you I was just such a normal person. We don't listen to those normally. I mean, how many times you're like, I need to get in the other lane for some reason, but nah, I'm just going to stay here because I have to turn right at some point and then boom, there's something that comes in front of you. Yeah, I mean, you have those intuition gut things we don't listen to enough. And that sounds right. like one that you, have, you were able to listen to, that you were t able to tune that in or tune into that. It's, it's amazing. Yes. And so then I started being curious, really kind of curious. Mm -hmm. And I started reading like... Um, um, Brian, Dr. Brian Weiss, I started all of his past life books, okay. um, minds, many masters yes. was, mm -hmm. you know, those books. And yep. I got intrigued with past lives like that just really, I, I totally believe that. And then, um, and then I also read the Celestine prophecy, which many people read about, there are no coincidences. And, mm -hmm. um, that was, and I, and I just started studying more and more and and this idea of past lives led me to the akashic record that you wanted to talk a little bit about them absolutely so that, that's yeah, a very so interesting thing to me because i know some people locally that you know i i say claim i have not experienced it so i will always say people claim things i don't you know everyone has their own experiences but i say that he claims that he can read the akashic records he was given half a key and had to create the other half to access it. Yes. And so the Akashic records are the home of your soul's past, present, and future lifetime information. So it's like a big repository of all of the lives that you've led. I've also and everything... heard that it's not just actions, though. It's also every thought, correct? It's just a yes. database of everything. Mm -hmm. so it's a database. It could be a thought that you don't act upon. So that's always a good sign, right? If you have a negative thought and you don't act upon it, that's kind of a, I don't know, it's like a, taking off a demerit in a way. It's kind of like a good point, you know, <laughs> versus acting on thoughts that weren't yes. great. And it, yeah. Yes, and it could be even as simple as... Um, the idea that it's the the internet of the spiritual realm i, yes, I find yeah, that an interesting way of looking correct. at it well i mean I, as a person from science i i know how what your thoughts are about the the world being a hologram or a hallucination you know an illusion or a simulation there are a lot of interesting scientific things that lean towards some stuff that we just that are counter they're counter productive in a way or they just clash with our general understanding of things. Well, I'm so open-minded, Mark. Um, when when I started on my spiritual journey, my my spiritual mantra was "Bring it on." <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm like, and I encourage everyone to have that as their spiritual mantra because it makes me one of the things that um, one of the things that my guides have always said to me is that I have to stay neutral um and in the middle and so even within this extraordinary political climate that we're in um my my is to stay neutral because there are so there are always multiple perspectives yes and people people have their thoughts and their feelings based on their own experiences right. and their and their own upbringings and so they're always just stay centered, stay centered, stay balanced. Yeah. And so that allows me to, to just study whatever I want, right? That because there's nothing in that, that says to me, you're, 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 you're pushing the, the envelope there. You can't study that. That's against our religion or that's against, you know, any sensibility for me. Um, I love it. Yeah. It's a beautiful I, I just, thing. Yeah, I, I mean, love hearing I, people's perspectives. I, I love it too, and, and I, I always want to engage in conversation, but it's very challenging because we are all on different, I call them different mile markers of the same road to the same journey. Mm -hmm. So some people, yes. are just, they're, they're a couple exits. I don't want to say behind in a negative sense. They just haven't gotten there yet. That's not a big deal. It's not, you know, everyone's on different paths. Sometimes it is hard to be objective and open sharing the openness like well i see it from this angle because some people have their belief and once they believe something it becomes this fixed thing that's very hard to chip away at 
So I'm always of the thought, it's like, I like ideas and I like opinions, you know, those are things we can be, that become more malleable and, and allow open-mindedness to kind of take over in that respect. Yes. Yeah. So Akashic Records. So, so tell me how you got to the Akashic Records or how you got to, to this in the first place. Yeah, so every year on um, every year on January 1st, I ask my own spiritual guidance team, what would you like me to learn this year? And it can be something like the Akashic Records, which it was one year, all the way to study your body. You don't understand how your body works, right? Like it, right. Like and it could be yourself, anything. Self care, some some kind of other yeah. thing that you need to take a step back, possibly. Yeah. From always being outward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and in the past couple of years, I had one happen two years in a row, and I guess I failed the first year. <laughs> but the, the the request was to learn to live in the present moment. What does that really mean, right? Yes. And and so so every year I ask the same question on New Year's Day, so that I I get what I'm supposed to study. So one year it was the Akashic Records, and I had no idea what they were, but when I found out, oh my gosh, Mark, I was so intrigued because I was so into past lives. It is and so, so interesting. I, it yeah, really so I, yeah. I studied with Linda Howe, H-O-W-E. Mm-hmm. I think she's a wonderful Akashic Record teacher. I actually, and, I believe I read a book of hers, yeah. Yes, and she's great in person, she's so funny. Um, and she's a delightful teacher. And um, and so I studied and I did so many Akashic readings over the years. And the best part is that I love when people come back, they'll come back and say, oh, my God, this it happened. What you what you said. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, so so one woman in particular, her son, uh, she was disappointed in her life because she was just a stay at home mom. And in her records it said that she is here to ensure that her son becomes a scholar and is brilliantly and able healthy and able to learn because one day he will work on a vaccine that will help all of humanity and then i don't know maybe like 10 years later eight years later she wrote me to say i just want you to know that my son was hired by this um, Har- I think she said Harvard Labs to help create a vaccine for AIDS. Oh, that's amazing. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and she said, I just wanted you to know that that I followed what what they said in the records, yeah. and and here he is now. So she goes, I just thought you'd be as excited as I am, and I'm like, I am. So you and, provide um, Kashik readings. I well. do. I do. Yeah. I should yep. have known that ahead of time. I would have uh, tried to get some swag out of it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah I've done a um, Mine was very unique. Well, it was unique. That's about it. Yes. <laughs> I they was, they yeah, are. Yeah, are. Mine are. My, my readings are always very practical, too, because I want people to be able to understand uh, how their past and their present is influencing their future. Yes. And, um, yeah, that's a really big uh, piece of it as well. Yeah, I, yes. both of my both are when I did my past life regression, none of my lives were on Earth. They were both otherworldly. Huh? Yeah. So I well, found that, that, interesting. that yes, and so you're here for the big show. I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out still. <laughs> <laughs> this this is an amazing lifetime. It seems like it seems like we're going to hell in a handbasket, right? Yeah. Um. But we're not. We're actually we're actually moving through a very very intense time in our evolution. Yeah, it's a tipping point um, for sure. Yes, and so all of us who there are so many beings that are here from off planet, and there's so many of us have that have been on the spiritual journey, you know, taking the bumps in all these lifetimes. Um, because one of the things that Yeshua or Jesus said to me is that. It never ended well for any spiritual person before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, I love that. Yeah, you're either stoned or worshipped in a weird way. So I don't know which, yes. one, which one it is, right? Yes. And so he said, this is the lifetime where um, my next book. Oh, let me talk about my next Absolutely, book. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. My next book I'm writing with King Solomon. And so um, he arrived in my room when I was falling asleep. And he said, Robin. And I immediately who he was, mm-hmm. I must have known him. 
um, maybe in a past life, but I knew exactly. I said, yes, King Solomon, how may I help you? And, and he said, I need my army of spiritual warriors. That means people that have been doing the spiritual thing for forever, right? Yeah. Yeah. To become divine warriors. And when that happens, we'll create a tipping point on the planet where the rest of humanity will rise into higher consciousness. Yeah, that's, that's and, where we're at for sure. Right. And that's what, that's, that's where we're, you know, we're trying, we're trying to create a tipping point on the planet, but I just want to explain the difference between a spiritual warrior and a divine warrior, please. if I may. Yes, please. Yeah. So a spiritual warrior is someone who has studied spirituality till they're blue in the face, right? They'll go to any course, they'll read any book, they're just, they're just in it and they're doing their best to, uh, to live it. But when you're a spiritual warrior, there's a concept that is really important and that is that um, pain is inevitable and suffering is, a, and suffering is an option. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is an option, okay. meaning that pain is not going. <clears throat> well, yeah, but the idea be external forces or even internal forces that have pain associated with them. Yes, For yes, sure. but the idea of suffering, of of just wallowing in your pain, or wallowing in your situation is is an option now. We yeah, can do that. It really is. It really is good to separate from that i mean you mentioned a couple yeah. concepts as in living in the now obviously eckhart tolle you know the power of now is always a big one that everyone points toward as well as uh the suffering of buddha talked about connection being the cause of all suffering right um but it, yes. it sounds like you might have a different concept of of suffering or what causes the suffering or do you are you in line with kind of that buddhist practice of connection being that suffering or leading to that suffering um, sorry, I was, you sort of pulled away there for a moment oh, in, that's okay. in the, in the, in the connection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the connection has been a little <laughs> sketchy, so I apologize. Uh, I think people are jackhammering around, uh, around here. So internet's in and out or something, but, uh, you mentioned yeah. like connection being the, the source of the suffering, right? For me, yes. my suffering was directly connected to my consciousness towards certain things in my life. Once I was able to let go of those things, that's yes. when the suffering eased. And then it just kind of, for me, slowly kind of just became exponentially more and more, you know, able to let, let go. Yeah. So I, I, I read a very interesting little formula the other day because I was really trying to see what are some of the other perspectives on suffering? I, I am very familiar with my own suffering, but I wanted to have more of a, a textbook type type of answer. And one of the things I read is that suffering, uh, well, let me say it the other way, pain plus resistance equals suffering. That makes sense. Pain plus resistance equals suffering. Absolutely. Yeah. Because you have to let it go through you, uh, holding on to it. That's really where it is, right? It's oh, did I lose you? Robin, are you there? That resistance is what keeps you in suffering. And so I think the key is to find out how to take away the resistance. What do you need to do in order to be able to, to be able to accept the pain? Because I think acceptance of the pain or acceptance of your life is the first step to a eradicating suffering in your life. Oh, absolutely. It's kind of the first step to any problem solving, right? Identify the problem. Yes. Like, right. I mean, it's kind of, it, it, it really is. And once again, we talk about these things as simple concepts, but they're not easy concepts. Oh my goodness. No. You know what I mean? No. It's everything's, everything's a simple answer. It's like, oh, well I, every time I kick this door, my foot hurts. Well, don't kick the door. Well, sometimes right. <laughs> something's throwing your door, your foot into the door. It's not anything you can do about it. So, so it's right. one of those things, right? Yes. Where it's a simple answer, so, it's just not easy. Yeah. So in Feast and Famine, the, the divine healing path that Sophia brought forth 
um, is four concepts. Two we've already talked about. Uh, one is that um, the first is that pain is inevitable, right? We're an integrated system, mind, body, spirit, and emotion, and we're not alone, right? Absolutely. So there's a lot of opportunities to be in pain. So that's a given, but suffering is an option. So at this stage of the game, suffering is an option, meaning that you can choose to suffer or you can choose not to suffer, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Because just because you're in pain doesn't mean you have to suffer. Right. And then the next is, the third one is surrender is required. So what is surrender? Surrender is when you decide that you are no longer going to do whatever it is that's creating suffering in your life. Mm -hmm. Now, Sophia always says to me, she knows when someone has truly surrendered. Like surrender is not like, I'm so tired of this stupid ass shit. I'm not doing it anymore. Right. That's it's not, not surrender. Up. You're right. It's not, surrender is not giving up. That's not what no. that is. No, surrender is go. saying I am done, right? Right. Whether you say it with a pounding of the fist or not, you can really clearly, very calmly say I am done. Yes. Right. Yes. But when that happens, when when you have truly surrendered, you know how you want to know the trick to knowing how you're in surrender. I would love to know. With trick. within thirty seconds, thirty three minutes, thirty minutes, one day, doesn't matter. You always get the answer to why you were suffering in the first place. Very. It's like. Even in your work, right? Like you're just like, ah, I'm just, I'm so frustrated. I'm just going to go take a shower, right? And then you get in the shower and then all of a sudden the answer to the work problem appears. Oh yeah. It's like an epiphany, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's because you're so relaxed in the shower, right? Yeah. You're so surrendered to the fact that ah, I'm just going to relax here. And then all of a sudden you get the answer because you surrendered to the idea that you did just didn't know the answer yeah. and I give up. Absolutely. Right? It's but, almost like that's why sleep is a great place to have these epiphanies. Yes. Or put a notebook in your nightstand because you wake up with these insights that you would never come across because you're so distracted with every part of life consciously right. that you and, can't. You and can't so busy beating other. yourself up, right? Absolutely. Like, yeah. uh, what is wrong with me? So, so now we have pain is inevitable. Suffering is an option. Surrender is required. And the number four is grace must be allowed. So in surrender, you will always receive the grace that you need to help you to heal the painful thing that you're going through. Very interesting. Except when you're not willing to allow grace in. Right. And why would, why would you not? I mean, one of the things I always think about is that people have a persona Right. Like I'm the loser in my family and everything always goes wrong for me and so keep that persona up. Right. I'm not saying I am the loser. I'm saying someone may right. someone may a be thinking that. Leader. Right. Like, yes. For sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you have a persona that you can't truly believe that you could have a grace filled life, one where where you're living in connection and you can see all of the beauty of nature and everything that's possible and and abundance right of uh, resources if you can't see yourself being worthy of that you can't you won't allow the grace in of course not it it, it really all comes down to sell you know that yourself of how you feel about towards yourself. right yeah Feeling worthy, right? Yeah, Feeling we're connected worthy. to and the ego and so many things define us. I mean, I would I would venture a guess that definitely more than fifty percent of people are defined by the job they do, or that's how they define mm -hmm. themselves, right? We're human yes. beings, not yes. human doings. Why are we concerned so much about what we do versus how we are? I, it it's a concept that just it it makes me uh, confused sometimes. I guess with, uh, it does. It me too. Like that's why it took me three years to actually. From the time that I stood on my deck declaring that I wanted to help to when I could actually leave because I couldn't, I, I couldn't see myself other than this career that I had had in my corporate life. Right. Right. I, I, I didn't know how to not be that. That's the true surrendering, um, right? I mean, you're talking about letting go of your stable in this physical material world environment that 
you know, you need to survive and live, right? You need to breathe and provide to the spiritual side. How do you let go of that? All those things that you've collected or, you know, over the years that you see that you put value on Mm -hmm. materially versus spiritually. Yes. Yes. And, um, one of my favorite stories, my daughter, uh, the, the, I, I just left corporate America and over the weekend, she was mad at me. She was mad at me on, on, on that Friday. She said, well, what if I need six pairs of jeans at once, mom? <laughs> and I said to her, if you need six pairs of jeans at once, we have a much bigger problem yeah, no kidding. <laughs> than my leaving corporate America. And so she was a little <laughs> mad at me. But then on Monday, I was already in my office, which was across from her bedroom. Okay. And, uh, and she was going to get into the carpool. And, and she said to me, Mom, does this mean that every day when I get out of school, you're actually going to be home now? And I said, yes, Gabby, that's what this means. She goes, oh, cool. I didn't realize that. And then she went uh, off to school. Funny, so right? she didn't, yeah, she didn't need the six pairs of jeans ever. She just needed, um, your, she just needed your presence. Right. But she presence. was worried, right? She was For worried sure. about her, her material needs. Um, which we all are, but it, 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 there, I don't know how to explain it, but when you're in alignment, uh, with your gifts and who you are and what you can bring, I mean, Oprah even says that she always says, uh, do what you love and the money will follow. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's true because you, you become the creator of your own life. So I just want to step back, Mark, to go back to the King Solomon book, because this is talking about is it remember he said i need my spiritual warriors to become divine warriors and when that happens there'll be a tipping point on the planet and the rest of humanity will come into higher consciousness so this idea of a divine warrior i wanted to get to so the spiritual warrior is someone who is constantly learning constantly challenging what they understand and know on the spiritual journey i call that the stage of mastery because they're they're learning everything they possibly can and suffering is still an option when you become a divine warrior you become those teachings right, right. you're no longer learning them you step into them well, and you, you become them. them yes you absolutely. are the teachings mm-hmm. right yeah. and then in that state of being a divine warrior suffering is no longer an option which I found very profound because what does that mean? What that means is that if you're really truly living your divine nature on this planet, basically living heaven on earth, which is another big spiritual term, that means that you're living as if you were living in the non-physical, as if you were living in heaven, right? Which I'm, I'm going to put, I could bet you 10 bucks, Mark, that there's no suffering going on in heaven <laughs> or the there's, idea there's of the non-physical. Right. I would definitely think so, <laughs> for sure. Right. And yeah. so if we're going to emulate that, like see the world through the eyes of God or goddess, the divine, then there's no place for suffering there. Of course, right. there's going to be pain. Yeah, pain is inevitable. It never goes away. I feel but, like we've all been in some part of our lives like that. I mean, I would think almost everyone's had a really good week. You know what I mean? Yes. Your 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 stuff's just lined up correctly, and you yes. know, you talk about the wheel of fortune, right? Where like the at some point the wheel's like on a on a chariot, and it's at the bottom at some point, and then at the top. But in a way, if you're aligned with it, it will always be smoother, or you know, than than the resistance part that you're talking about. We've all had a great week and been, oh my gosh, this is amazing, and then it turns. You don't even know why, right? Or we've been in a slump and tried to get out of it. You know, it's same on the other end. It, yes, it's, it's an thing. And also this alignment, what what I what here's a good trick too, I think that I learned when things aren't going my way, you know, there's a part of me that wants to be mad, but then I heard that when I don't when I when I accept that let's say I a client goes to work with somebody else and or I didn't get a publishing deal or something like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Something the, didn't go your um, way. Something didn't go my way. Now I kind of get excited about it because I always know that something better is coming. Right. 
we lose something now for the sake of something better down the road. Right? right? Like when, when God clo closes a door, he always opens a window or right. the other way around. When he closes Absolutely. the window, he always opens the door. And so I find that when I, it, it, first of all, it makes me feel better because I can accept the loss without taking it personally. Humanity right? loves having that. It's almost like an interesting, ex not an excuse for sure, but it's definitely a peace of mind to to have that concept or that thought in your head that, oh, well, that just means something better is right around the corner. I mean, it, it's something definitely better a good way is to coming. talk yourself into that for sure. Yeah. And I, I really encourage everyone to see it that way. Right? I would actually see argue it? that all the doors and windows are open. It's just whether you're <laughs> aligned with them or not at that time. I mean, it's, it's really not someone closing a door. It's really right. just not aligned with the door. You just, you right. do, you're walking in a path. And if the door's in front of you, you're going to walk into it or through it, right? If it's right. off a little bit, maybe the window's there. That's why you, that's why you find the window. So, yeah, it's, it is an interesting concept. I, I, I personally like it. Everything's open. We just have to find it or we, we just have to align right. with it at some point. We have to open, open our eyes to see them, right? right? Correct. Our perceptions mm -hmm. need to change to find mm -hmm. other entries and, or other points of entry. And sometimes we don't see them open. I, I like that, Mark, that the windows are all open. Sometimes we can't see they're open because we don't, it's not the right time. Right. We're not looking for in us direction. to see them. Absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely correct. I mean, I'm not, 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 but absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, you know, it's not divine timing. You right. know, we, we are still living the journey. We are still living the journey. And, you know, in my practice, when I come across folks that are, that are, uh, struggling and, and suffering, um, you know, I work so hard to help them to see that when they release the suffering, then all the answers that they need will come. But in a state of suffering, which is an, another, this is what I wanted to talk about, is this is what um, Feast and Famine is all about, is this idea that the primary addiction on our planet is to suffering yes and then we have secondary addictions where we choose our poison for me it was food uh for others it could be you know drugs or alcohol or sex or or the social media um, yeah. gambling i mean there are social there are many its own thing actually that is they have got us locked on like little animals in a maze. I mean, that is a ridiculous. Yes. That one's not even it an is. addiction. That is something that you we can't even as animals get out of. It's so crazy. But I mean, yeah. we can consciously, but obviously just unconsciously, we are just tapping that button, tapping that button, getting that pellet, getting yes. that pellet. It's a it's an amazing yes, it's it's an amazing it's thing scary. watching this happen. It is scary. It's very scary. And to your point, um, you know, the 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 drugs, the food, the sex, the gambling, those are effects. And I agree with that point. I'm going to let you uh, please finish your point on that. Uh, and then we'll, we'll circle. Yeah. Around here. I mean, they, they, they truly are Mark. Uh, I, I, they are truly addictions. The others, right. The vices yeah. are addictions. I'm not, I am not challenging that oh, no, whatsoever, not but they're, no. they're, 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 they're symptoms. The d addictions to, to vices are symptoms of the true problem, which is an addiction to suffering. Yes. And suffering is a really uncomfortable word for people. Um, I'm not really sure, maybe because, you know, of the religious word, it's a religious word, or maybe because we don't, we think somebody else is suffering, we're not. And truly what suffering is, is again, resistance to healing what is the source of your pain. Could I give you a, a thought of to why we use, we don't use and we use trauma because I, I believe we interchange suffering with trauma in in the world we use the word trauma instead right i believe it's my yeah. it's my opinion that suffering is a personal accountability and trauma always makes it sound like someone else did it to you if that makes sense yes. right so we've all yes. experienced traumatic events but how we how we internally process them and get through them is our accountability if we continually use terms like trauma, it almost sounds like, well, we're not accountable for that because someone did that to us. And yes, I, I feel like that wor the world has gone to a, a pat, pass the buck kind of situation. 
where we're asking, we're saying, oh, no, all these other things are doing it, not us. No, we, we are responsible for our, for all of it. We are responsible. And we need to take our own accountability in that way. Yeah. And the greatest, the greatest source of trauma, I think, for most people happens in our childhood. It is. Yeah. Right. For, for various reasons. Yeah. Me too. Are you familiar and, with how the and, subconscious kind of builds or how it's created? How our what? Say our that sub, again. How our subconscious is created in a way, how no. that, the operating system. So I've gone through a lot of therapy and basically humans are one of the only animals that are born prior to 100% uh, readiness, if that makes sense. We're born mm-hmm. with about 20% brain uh, uh, building or what, you know, about 20% of our brain is complete by the time we trigger birth. Whereas if you notice like uh, a deer would come out of a, you know, a, a and then we'll be able to walk a few hours later. We're very dependent on our families until a certain point. We can't really take care of ourselves. And during right. that time, during that 20%, from 20% to 100% is about between the ages of being self-aware, about a year and a half to about seven or eight. And all the experiences that we, exp- that we have during that time is during our brain development. And then that actually locks in and becomes kind of our background operating system down the road it's a very interesting concept uh, that i've that i've followed and found it to be very accurate actually because those things that we experience we now see them in our regular lives and we have subconscious you know reactions to them that have not have nothing to do with our conscious reaction yeah anyways (laughs) and and here's 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 something that i think is important for people to know and that is that we actually choose our parents prior to our incarnation. Yes. And that blows people's minds because they cannot believe that they actually picked that jerk. I can right? actually speak or, exactly right? to that point. Yes. You know, right? it's interesting. But, right. Yeah. Go ahead. But we, we picked these parents because we had an intention to grow to a certain place. Our soul has an intention to grow to a certain, certain amount of experiences to fulfill its destiny and prior to coming in we pick our cast of characters for our play right yeah it's the interesting first because being I've asked our that. parents yeah, yeah. well it's first funny. being our parents mm-hmm. yeah right yes absolutely and, and it once people really understand that it doesn't actually it doesn't mean that you have to condone anything that your parents have done to you it just you need to accept that you chose those teachings as part of the early path that your soul is on in this incarnation. Right. And I have two, two thoughts on that. One, one is interesting that the concept of that is weird, right? Cause as humans, we have ego. Why would mm-hmm. I choose these assholes to birth me? I mean, I, I know I'm using right. crazy language, but why would I choose these abusers, for example, to birth me? But right. the point is the soul is, has zero ego the ego is doesn't exist so that it's not about that it's about right. the other soul so yes i chose to be there for that other person to experience or to learn or to grow at some point it's such a backwards concept but once it once you hear it you go yes the spirit has no ego the human's all ego of course you as a human would not choose those abusive parents but your soul wants to help the soul of the parent of those of those vessels uh you know, in some kind of way. Yes. I mean, it's all an agreement. And so uh, I studied at the Oneness University in uh, Chennai, India. Okay. The, 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 head, uh, the head of it is, uh, they're called um, a woman, Sri Ama and Sri Bhagavan. Not the kiss, not the hugging Ama, but another Ama. Mm-hmm. Ama means mother. So Sri Ama Bhagavan, the Oneness University, very wonderful teachings. And One of the things that Sri Bhagavan said is that the most important relationship that we can heal is the one with our parents. That sets the stage for every other relationship in our lives, right? And so if you're having problems in relationships, it's it's, it's, it's typically bubbling up from unhealed trauma, there's your favorite word, (laughs) from your relationship with your parents. And so I love the trauma stuff because that just takes the accountability off of my shoulders. And yes, well, that's what I'm I'm being a little facetious (laughs) there, but (laughs) yeah, but 
in order to move forward into your life and in order to move from a spiritual warrior to a divine warrior, you've got to let go of all of your baggage. Like you've got to, you've got to look at these relationships, look at these healings. And that's what was so profound for me about Feast and Famine, Healing Addiction with Grace, is that I couldn't get through that book without going into some very intensive healing in my own life so I could understand the roles that my parents played in my life and understand the roles that I played in my own life, right? right and sure. others played. And um, and I think I said, call it living an examined life. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. the key. Like if you can examine your life and really heal your, heal your inner world, um, then life is just so much more calm. I guess is a word, less anxiety, harmonious, right? I think possibly, but uh, what was the word harmonious or peaceful? Yeah. Harmonious. Like yes. Yeah. yeah. Peaceful, joyful, abundant, uh, loving, right? There's because... the rub, right? There's the rub, Robin. What we have is we have people just barely, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, trying to get their yes. stuff in order. And they're so distracted by the material. They have to, I mean, it's part of the survival aspect of animals that we are. You know, the animal side that we are, the, the Maslow's hierarchy that we have to take care of, that we don't always get to the spiritual, right? And now as more people are finding food, shelter, and clothing, not easy, but easier than prior generations, now we can focus on a lot of social things that are coming up. It, it, it's like yes. we've, we've, we've answered some of these base questions. Now we need to um, go through the other way, the other side. Yeah, one of my favorite teachers uh, to study with is Carolyn Mace, M-Y-S-S, -S, Carolyn Mace. And uh, she's she just put out a program called Riding the Phoenix. And um, and it talk, she talks about this idea that COVID-19 is certainly about healing, but it was also about healing the planet, right? We saw that the, the pollution um, eased up with everybody yes. staying home for a couple of months, we saw that people were able to be with their families, right? And be yeah. with their children. There are some negative sides to all of this. I'm not really setting <laughs> this up as a panacea, but right. at the same time, it was, it, it's been a wonderful opportunity for people to stop, right? Stop yes. the, the wheel, right? And say, yeah. wow, I'm actually home now. Um, what can I do? You know, what can I do? And I think, you know, we, there's so many funny memes on Facebook, right? Some people will be like, at, you know, they're, they're, you know, some days they're calm and they're knitting and they're, or they're, you know, doing artwork and other days they're like slugging down shots at eight o'clock in the morning, right? Depends <laughs> on what the day is, right? right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. It's an interesting Could time right now. For sure. Could this time be about this evolutionary jump, right, between um, this human doing, as you said, to becoming a human being? Right? I would love to take that optimism. I just see the world, unfortunately, how it's showing itself to be. And it's kind of, a, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's an election year. So we have to we have to put these really crazy concepts out there and everybody cooped up, giving someone a reason to go out and just not be cooped up just everyone's kind of on edge a little bit i think you know yeah but, well you know it's on us change. it's on us individually to do it and if more of us would do that we would all be better for it i think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's all so i'm not i'm not gonna get political about it for sure <laughs> yeah yeah no and change change in the middle always feels like chaos so you know hopefully well, the we're in the, the omelet, middle of, right? of it or the breaking of the eggs you have to break you have to shake something loose to in order to grow. It's, yes. And it's painful. It is so painful to go through that. Right. Right. And I think by staying grounded and um I think I think we can usher in this time. Especially the people who have been knocked conscious. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that, you know, their job is not to stay on either end of the fringe, right? Right but to stay grounded in the center and to be able to see other people and hear other people's perspectives without a strong emotional reaction, but a more grounded um, 
peaceful reaction. Yes. Well, this is this is where it's interesting. I I always uh, go back to a quote that's credited to Aristotle, and it's the mark it's the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Mm-hmm. And everyone has their belief system, but no one's entertaining any other thought. No one's going, hey, let's take a step and see your viewpoint. I don't have to agree with it just because you shared it, but I can allow you to share it, right? Or you can at least go through the concept or the, you know, the thought process of an idea without having to take it on as your own. But now it's like if you don't agree with this, if you don't specifically explicitly agree with this, then you're against it. And I find yes. that a little interesting. Yes. I do too. I, I find that I see that a lot too. Yeah. And I, and I don't know what, what's driving that. Do you have any thoughts on what's driving I, I do, people actually. to be so extreme? Yeah, it's, it's virtue signaling. Um, the, the majority is taken over by the squeaky wheel of the minority. And mm-hmm. this isn't, this is not any, I'm speaking in very general terms. I hope that everyone understands it. I am not going to get into the, you know, the weeds of what the individual problems are. But as a whole, we have people who have power who aren't going to lose it and they're behind the scenes and they control everything. And then we have us who think we actually have some control over our things physically, but not as much. We have more control over our personal things, not general things. Right. So if, for example, uh, well, I might as well talk about it here. So I received an email from in my, at my work, and it was virtue signaling, 100%. It spoke about how, mu- how not racist someone in our, in, our, in our company is. And they misquoted Martin Luther King, quote, the most famous Martin Luther King quote of all times. And they mislabeled one of the, one of the uh, groups that they support. So <laughs> I found that to be very funny. If, if you're going to put yourself out there and speak about how not something you are, you might, as want, might want to get it right. If that makes sense. Yes. So, yes. but if you notice, you're getting email after email is, I am on this side. I am on this side. Cause if, if you don't explicitly say you're on a side, then you're against it. And that is, that is not how conversation happens. You know, it yes. does, it's not open enough. We need to be able to say, please share what your thought is and let me share mine. And we'll meet in the, you know, we'll meet somewhere. I'm sure we'll have at least a better understanding of each other when we, you know, when we part ways. Yeah. Right. I mean, if we, if we did, if we weren't capable humanity of listening, right, to both sides, we'd never have peace on this planet anywhere. That's true too. Right? Like yeah. we, we have to be able to hear both sides because honestly. Um, and there's more than two sides, by a, the way. <laughs> there's a, yes, every yes. individual, we have 7.7 billion sides right now. Let's be honest. Everyone is an individual. I mean, we're even twins are not exact, exactly the same. Right. And people, while it may appear to be outrageous to you, their 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 view or their actions, they can justify it. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. For their for their own life. And there's an interesting show on uh, Netflix, I think, called Fauda. F-A-U-D-A, and it's it's a story of um, Israel and Palestine, and and the and the police officers. I know they're not called police officers there, right. but from both sides, mm-hmm. and it's the story of them, um, their families, and then their and then their actions against each other. Right. But boy, if you really looked at it, you couldn't. It would be hard to justify either side. Yes, absolutely. Because. Because they're both doing it for the, for the benefit of their own families, um, yeah. right? And so, you know, you you can see why, why people in a conflict, that's the conflict, right? They're they're they feel feel that it should be one way for their for their tribe, right? And the other side thinks it should be that one way for their tribe, but when you compare them, you can see that they both feel that what they're doing is in the highest and best good for their own tribe. Yes, absolutely. And tribalism is tribalism is the one thing. I mean, the the argument for me would be our societies as a whole have just gotten too large. Mm-hmm. You you can you can take a concept like even communism and with 30 people, communism can work. 
with 30 people, everyone mm-hmm. held accountable themselves. Everyone's watching each other. Great. But you get to 100 people and one person doesn't follow that line, the whole concept falls apart. So it works very well in a vacuum, but it's very hard with humans to all be on the same page because we all feel differently about things. Yes. And and then we and then it's hard to trust anyone. Absolutely. You know, yeah. It, it it's very hard to trust what is going on in anything in our country because we have two extreme forms of communication. And and so it's very interesting to watch both sides. As I said, where I have to sit in my work in the middle, it's yeah. like I'm watching a really interesting tennis game, it feels like. Yeah, it's, it's boom, very interesting, boom, isn't boom. it? <laughs> right. But you do have that underlying, remember, the court is, you know, the underlying control, right? <laughs> so you've got the mm-hmm. players on the court, but the court and the stadium and everything else is another set of controls that we don't even have personal access toward, you know, to right, which we don't have right. personal access. So there's other controls in there that we don't have, that we don't know about or that we aren't able to change we can only work on ourselves let's be honest the, the best thing is nothing else matters but ourselves let's work on ourselves to be good to others be good back and there we go <laughs> simple well, because, but not easy right yeah in in messiah within yeshua shared that world peace begins within you absolutely right? you're the ripple in the pond right and so if we want world peace on the planet we have to find world peace within ourselves that is a very good look once again inward to outward right we right have to, we take it inward we we find that peace and then we can express the peace or we can right. share the peace or whatnot but you know you talked a lot to, today mark about tolerance too i mean people have to become more tolerant of other people and their Absolutely. perspectives and um and, and, we, and we don't tolerance have that. is funny because i think I think language has been bastardized. That's my that's that's one of my things where I'm I'm kind of on that path where I remember when certain words meant completely different things, right? And mm-hmm. now I feel like people say tolerance as in you accept for yourself what I'm sharing with you. And I don't I that's not what tolerance is. Tolerance is merely no. allowing that thought to to exist and yes. not and not squashing it. But people mm-hmm. have taken tolerance as a word, and it's almost like you, you now become submissive to it. Well, you must be tolerant. That means you must submit to my concept, and that's not the way tolerance is designed no. to be. Tolerance is just, oh, you think one plus one equals three. That is a great, you know what? That's so creative. Thank you so much for sharing that. I don't need yeah. to agree with you, but you're welcome to feel that way about it. You know, I'm not going to squash your thought, but that doesn't mean I have to accept it either. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I just feel like language so, yeah. is a very interesting thing. It 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 is. It is. And um just talking of you know about language for a moment, I I I really want to convey that um so getting back to feast and famine, yes, um healing addiction with grace. So yes, it is a spiritual book, but it also talks a lot about uh addiction in general and certainly food disorders and relationships with families. And so I wouldn't want anyone to shy away from the book thinking that they're not spiritual enough to read it. Um, But I think that if they are interested in all on spirituality, it's, it, it will, it will really shape the way that they're thinking about it as well. Very well said. I think that's yeah. a great stopping point at this point. Uh, did you have anything yeah. else you wanted to share about? Would you like to once again uh, cover your three your three books that you've written, and then provide any of your contact information so that people can reach out to you when they when they have yes, any questions? Yes, that'd be great. <clears throat> yes, thank you. So my three books are Messiah Within, Heal, um, a guide to embracing your inner divinity, and that's about um, how how to embrace your inner divinity, how to find the 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 path inward and then the divine keys are um is a book that will help you to live from your inner world what happens next right okay what happens next and then feast and famine is so you're struggling right you're still struggling suffering you're finding it difficult to live that inner world how do you heal that um and so one of the things interesting in feast and famine with uh what you 
was shared with me was that I was actually supposed to write Feast and Famine first, right? Let's yeah. get healed first and then write Messiah within and then write the divine keys. But I wasn't ready to write Feast and Famine. Yeah. And um, and one of the reasons why, and I alluded to this at the very beginning, so it's a to circle back. Mm -hmm. There's a concept of will, W-I-L-L, and there's three wills. There's personal will, goodwill, and divine will. And personal will is when you are truly um, in service to yourself. And then goodwill is in service to others, and divine will is in service to God, goddess, the divine, right? Yes. I was really great at being in service to the divine and being in service to others. So I had goodwill and divine will totally down, right. really good at it. What I was missing in addiction was personal will. Yeah, I wasn't truly in service to myself. And so until I learned to be in service to myself, to be willing to, to come out of suffering and struggle and to heal my past and my present and decide how I'm going to live an empowered future, until I could do that, I couldn't finish Feast and Famine. And so that's why they had me start with the other two books first. But now here they all are. And I think that I think they're a very helpful tool. And I'm also available. I'm a I'm a life coach. Um, I help people to stop suffering and start living. I also um, am a writing coach. I'm helping other people to write their stories. Excellent. And so I love to do that as well. And um, yeah, and that's that's how I'm available. My website um, is uh, is clarity.com, C-L-A-R-E, like my last name, dash I-T-Y dot com. And again, clarity, www.clarity.com, <laughs> C-L-A-R-E dash I-T-Y dot com. Excellent. And that's how people can find me. Well, that's great. I also, yeah, and Mark, I also offer a 30-minute uh, free consultation um, if people just want to stop by and ask me, you know, set up an appointment to ask me more about my services or to just chat. I oh, love it. I'm happy well, to do that. I may have to uh, check your services for uh, an Akashic Record reading for sure. So Yes, that'd be, be great. That'd be fun. Do, do you have any those services are those also priced on your website at all or do they just yes they are you? yeah okay excellent. no they are and then at the bottom of, of my website on every page there's a scheduler so people can just schedule an appointment um it will sh it will show them when i'm available to meet oh that's great well maybe perhaps next time we'll have you on we could do the reading itself or something it's if you're up to that or yes some other oh time oh my gosh we'll, we'll that would be fun around. okay well how about yeah. this i know you're getting a new microphone very soon so maybe uh, <laughs> My feel free to reach out. We're, we'll be happy to have you on again. It, it's been very enlightening. I, I, you know, like I said, I, I did a, a podcast, a three minute podcast on freedom of speech, and I am such a proponent. I'm so glad that we are allowed in this country of all countries, you know, I'm blessed to be here. Um, yes. We are allowed to express our feelings. I don't need to agree with you. I don't need to believe in you to believe or believe what you believe in to believe in you as a person. As right. A being. Yes. So, you know, if we could just be to that point, once again, tolerant, right? Just accepting of others, not accepting of their ideas, but just accepting people having their ideas. It would make, we'd have so many better conversations, but uh, yes, <laughs> there's my we soapbox. Would. I'll give it back. Here yeah. you go. <laughs> and yeah, no, I agree. I agree with you. And, and, you know, during, especially during this time with a lot of turmoil, you know, in our country, this is when we need to really look within Absolutely. and, and know, know that whatever we see, we are one. That is <laughs> and, true. To that point, if we, if you don't understand, if you prick yourself with a pin or prick someone else with a pin, that's going to come back around to you. It's just going to come mm -hmm. right around because we're all one. We're yes. all one. And and see that if you choose to see the other as if, as if, because you are, you are the divine, you know, we are the divine here. We are made in the image of God is so it says right in the, in, in, in the Bible, right. right? If we, if we could actually see the world 
through the, that divine lens, then I think things would be a lot different. I think so too. And, if we um, adopted Pascal's wager as well, like we don't have to necessarily believe in a higher being, for example, but if we lived our lives as if there were, right? Yes. Just that alone would be a positive shift in the correct direction. Yes, that'd be beautiful. That's a well, great place to end. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Robin. Uh, could you yeah, just tell us your website one more time and your and your newest yes. book? Yes, um, my website is clarity.com, C-L-A-R-E dash I-T-Y dot com. And my latest book is called Feast and Famine with a little hyper sand in the middle, Feast and Famine, Healing Addiction with Grace, which is available on Amazon and all major booksellers. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on. And I might have to take you up on the Akasha greeting. So yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so let me that'd know when you're available Mark. and we're going to do this. Um, once again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Once again, I'm Mark. I'm with Robin Clare, who wrote Feast and Famine. It's an bestseller you can get it on online there and on her website clarity.com that's c-l-a-r-e hyphen i-t-y dot c-o-m thanks again for joining us on not conscious and we'll have you back soon uh -huh.